This is chapter 17, the endocrine system. Now, the endocrine system is one of two communication systems in the body. The other one is the nervous system, where you have a very fast response, but it's very short. You respond, boom, it's over. The endocrine system is going to be slower to become activated as compared to the nervous system, but it's going to be longer lasting. It involves, instead of an electrical signal, that electrical impulse that you saw with the nervous system, this will involve chemical signaling with the release of the hormones. The hormones are going to be that chemical signal. The hormones are going to be transported to the target cell by the blood. So typically the hormone, when it's secreted by an endocrine gland, it doesn't... Um, stimulate a cell right there. It has to travel through the blood to another location. It's going to be responding to changes in the internal environment. It might be changes in pH. It might be changes in sodium levels. So it's, it's responding to the internal environment. It's helping to maintain that homeostasis. It also helps to control reproduction. Now, the structures you've got, endocrine glands, they are ductless, so you have the gland, the hormone's going to be secreted directly into that interstitial fluid, and then it's going to go from there into the blood, and the blood transports it to that target cell. Some endocrine glands, keep in mind, have multiple functions. So some are part of the endocrine system as well as maybe the nervous system. Some of them are part of the endocrine system as well as the digestive system. So don't let that surprise you when you, we get talking about some of the glands and the hormones that are being secreted by them. Doesn't this organ also play a role with another system? Yes, it might. The hormones are divided <coughs> excuse me, into one of two types. They are either steroid uh, or amine or protein. The steroid uh, compounds are derived from cholesterol. This is why you have to kind of be careful. Cholesterol by itself is not a bad thing. Now, if you have too much of it, yes, it is. But remember, cholesterol itself is used to help stabilize membranes. But it's also used, this is cholesterol right here. It's used as a template to make your steroid uh, hormones. And then the, the second type of hormone, as I said, sometimes they're referred to as amine. Sometimes they're referred to as um, proteins. Basically, what you end up with are chains of amino acids. And how long is that chain? That's where you can get real picky and distinguish. Is that a peptide or is it a protein? They're made up of amino acids. So how does the hormone work? Great. It's secreted by a gland. Now what? Well, once it's secreted by the gland, it's going to travel by the blood to the target cell. What is the target cell? Well, it depends on which hormone you're talking about. The hormone's going to bind to a very specific receptor on the target cell. That's why we call it a target cell. It has a receptor for that particular hormone. If the cell doesn't have a receptor for that hormone, the hormone's not going to do anything at all. It'll have no effect on the cell. So it has to have these specialized receptor for that particular hormone. The receptor, once the hormone binds to it, <coughs> here we go, surprise, surprise, it binds to it, there's going to be a shape change. That's going to trigger or initiate the next step, which is ultimately going to end up with the appropriate response. What is that response going to be? Well, it depends on the hormone, it depends on the target cell. I mean, are you talking about growth hormone binding to almost any one of the cells and triggering increased growth, increased mitosis? Or are you talking about uh, insulin that's being secreted and is going to affect glucose uh, uptake by the cells? It just depends. Now, the cellular response to the hormone, in other words, great, the hormone binds, what, what happens? Well, it may stimulate protein synthesis. 
that hormone may st uh, stimulate or activate certain enzymes, or it may deactivate or inhibit certain enzymes. It may cause a change in the permeability of the cell membrane so that it can maybe take up certain compounds. It may alter the rate of mitosis and cell growth. It may itself stimulate the secretion of other products or maybe even other hormones. We see that a lot. In terms of the pathway that the hormone receptor intracellular, what's going to happen? Well, if the hormone is hydrophobic, steroids are a type of uh, lipid or fat, so they are hydrophobic, so any of your steroid hormones are going to be able to easily cross the cell membrane as long as cell, the size is not a restriction. If the hormone is hydrophobic and it crosses that cell membrane easily. The receptor is going to be in the cytosol or in the nucleus. The hormone receptor complex, so the hormone binds to that receptor. That complex is going to move towards the chromatin. So if it's in the cytosol, it has to move now to the nucleus. If it's already in the nucleus, then that complex moves towards the chromatin. It's going to bind to a very specific area on the DNA. Chromatin is DNA. When the complex binds to the DNA, what is that going to trigger? It's going to trigger transcription of a particular area. And ultimately, once you have transcription, that's going to lead to uh, translation, which is protein synthesis. And that's what this picture here is depicting, is that you had one of these steroid hormones. <coughs> Excuse me. I've said it's traveling in the blood. It leaves the capillary the smallest of blood vessels. It's able to pass through that cell membrane. It's going to bind to receptor. In this case, it's in the cytoplasm. Now this complex now is going to help move into the nucleus where it binds to a specific area on the DNA. And that's going to trigger transcription. Remember, that's where you use the DNA as a template to make your messenger RNA. And then that's going to be followed by translation, where you're using that mRNA now to make protein. So here's the protein that is being made in response to what? To the hormone, ultimately. So that's great if the hormone is hydrophobic. But what happens when it's hydrophilic? When it is hydrophilic, it's going to have problems crossing that membrane. It can't, so it's going to need some help. So instead, the hormone will bind to the receptor that's on the surface of the cell membrane. That binding is going to trigger a cascade of events, what we call a series cascade. Things have to occur in a certain, certain order. So the hormone is what we would consider as the first messenger. It's the first binding. It binds to the receptor. That causes, like we always say, a shape change. A second messenger is usually what we call cyclic AMP or CAMP. So the hormone binds to the receptor. The receptor activates um, internally on the because the receptor usually extends the entire width of the membrane. So the hormones binding on the outer surface, but that triggers the shape change on the inside surface of that receptor internally. And that's going to activate what's known as a G protein. The G protein then in turn activates adenocyclase, which in turn is going to convert ATP to your cyclic AMP. What happens to the cyclic AMP? It now activates protein kinase that's in the cytosol, which is going to now initiate what's known as the phosphorylation cascade. Bottom line, these events all have to occur in a specific order. You don't get CAMP if you don't activate the G protein. You don't get G protein activated unless the uh, hormone has bound to the receptor. So it's like step one activates step two, which activates step three. And all these have to occur in a particular order. 
What is the ultimate effect? Well, it depends on the particular cell, but you're going to see some change in the cellular activity. So here is your hydrophilic hormone, typically a protein, that comes in, binds. Here's your receptor here on the outer surface of that membrane. And so it's very specific, once again, that the hormone binds to that receptor. And internally, here's your G protein. Well, when the, it's just sitting there normally. When the hormone binds, you have a shape change that's going to activate the G protein, which comes over here and activates the adenocycline, which is going to ultimately produce the CAMP, or CAMP, which that now is going to activate this protein kinase, which is going to come over here, and you typically, like I say, it's going to alter some type of metabolic process. You may have an inactive protein here, now you've activated it. But none of these steps down here will happen if the first few steps don't happen. So that's why we call it cascade. What's the benefit of a phosphorylation cascade? Well, it can increase the efficiency, speed, and the specificity of the response that you're going to have. It can also respond to very low levels of hormone. Now the response is going to be very short because that, that camp, that CAMP, is going to be very quickly deactivated unless you have more hormone that binds to it. What are some factors that affect the response? We have what we call downregulation and upregulation. Downregulation, this is where the target cells, um, they decrease the number of receptors. Because, why? Because you have excess hormone levels. And the bottom line for this is the cells are going to become less reactive because there's fewer receptors there. When hormone levels are very low, you tend to see upregulation, and this is where the opposite happens. Low hormone levels trigger the target cells to increase the number of receptors so that you're increasing basically the sensitivity of each cell. Instead of maybe having two receptors, you've increased it to 10. There are different types of interactions of hormones. Permissive effect is where you have a presence of one hormone enables another hormone to act. We see that a lot. Synergistic effect is where two hormones that have similar effects, they tend to produce uh, an even greater or amplified response. Uh, you may need to have two hormones sometimes required to get the appropriate response. So synergistic, you have two hormones that are working together. The antagonistic effect then is when you have two hormones that will have opposite effects. So how do you regulate the secretion of a hormone so they're not just constantly dumping all this hormone out? You have feedback loops. There's positive feedback and negative feedback. Positive feedback, you start releasing a hormone in the Positive feedback loop is going to trigger release of additional hormone, so you amplify the effect. This does not happen very often. One example is with the release of oxytocin. When a woman starts to go into labor, when um, at a certain point, <coughs> when the baby's head is pressing against the cervix at a certain time, it will start to trigger the release of oxytocin. Oxytocin is going to trigger contractions of the uterus. The woman's going to start to go into labor. When she goes into labor, the contractions of the uterus are helping to push the entire baby down, especially the head down to the cervix for childbirth you have that pressure, that triggers the release of more oxytocin, which triggers even greater contraction of the uterus, which is why a woman may start out in labor very, um, maybe just sort of a tense or uncomfortable feeling of the contractions, but as the labor progresses, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And why is that? It's because she's producing and secreting more and more oxytocin until finally the pressure is gone, which is gone once the baby is born. 
Most of the time you have negative feedback. That's the most common. And that's where you are uh, secreting the hormone and then you're getting whatever the appropriate response is for that hormone. And that response kind of turns around and then will inhibit the response of the hormone. When uh, glucose levels are high in the blood, it triggers the release of insulin. Insulin triggers the increased uptake of glucose. Well, if you increase the uptake of glucose, then that means the glucose levels in the blood now are going to start to drop. And that dropping is going to, to switch off insulin. You don't need it anymore. Endocrine gland stimulation. It can be stimulated by several different things. Uh, there's humoral, hormonal, and neural stimulation. Humoral is uh, a chemical stimulant or a chemical inhibition, but it's not a hormone. It's some other chemical. Hormonal is when one hormone stimulates or inhibits another um, hormone and then neural is when it's the nervous system that is doing the stimulation. So on this slide what we're looking at is just how ultimately everything you are trying to do goes back to trying to maintain homeostasis, trying to maintain that internal balance. So when whatever particular item you're looking at, whether it's a sodium concentration or glucose concentration, gets out of balance, then you need to have a response. You need to, and what is that response going to be? Well, something that's controlled by hormones, you need to secrete the appropriate hormone. The secretion of that hormone then triggers an appropriate response to correct the problem, whether it's getting the concentration of sodium if it was too low to get it back up or the glucose was too high to get it down, you're going to take corrective actions. As you correct and get those levels back, now in this particular case they're looking at glucocorticoid levels, you get them, they were too low, you get them back up. So you get now back up in that normal range, that is then the negative feedback loop means that then that turns around and it shuts everything off. You're in balance. You don't need to make any more corrections. You've already corrected the problem. So the rest of this chapter, what we're going to do is go through and look at the various endocrine glands. Um, we're going to be looking at them relatively briefly, if you will. Uh, we're not going to go into a whole lot of detail as compared to some other um, <coughs> levels of classes that you, you can take a whole class on the endocrine system if you want. Um, this diagram is showing the endocrine glands. In the brain, we're going to be looking at the pituitary gland. Now right above that is the hypothalamus, which we will also be looking at. Um, back here we have the pineal gland. On the trachea, which is back here in your air way, if you will. Um, we have the thyroid gland. On the back side of that you have the parathyroid gland, so we're going to be looking at that. We won't spend much time talking about the thymus. The thymus is considered an endocrine gland. We will talk about it more when we study the lymphatic system and talk about your immune system. Um, I will say that the thymus gland starts out large um, at birth, and as you grow older, it gets smaller and smaller, the atrophies um, over time. It's, but it doesn't really secrete a hormone per se. It's, it's more emphasis with the immune system, so we're going to wait and look at it at that time. On top of your kidneys, you have your adrenal glands. You've got your pancreas, which is tucked um, under and behind the stomach. In females, you've got your uterus and the ovaries, and in males, you have the testes. So we're going to go through and look at all of these endocrine glands, <coughs> and the, as I said, the hormones associated with them. So we'll start with the hypothalamus. Now the hypothalamus is involved with both the nervous system and the endocrine system. It has both uh, functions. It, 
it plays a role in both. Now, overall, the hypothalamus plays a major role in helping to maintain uh, homeostasis. It's kind of like control center. A lot of the information about the internal environment is being passed up to the hypothalamus, so it's monitoring it, and therefore knows um, receiving this information how to, and if adjustments need to be made. It is connected to the pituitary gland by what's commonly referred to as a stalk, the infobedilum. The hypothalamus itself actually does produce two hormones. It produces oxytocin and the antidiuretic hormone. One thing with the hormones you'll find that, um, I don't know if we're just lazy or what, but we tend to abbreviate them. So the antidiuretic hormone is often abbreviated as ADH. Uh, so both ADH and oxytocin are actually produced by the hypothalamus, but they are then um, stored in the pituitary, specifically in the posterior pituitary, and they'll be secreted from there. So it does produce a lot of other smaller hormones that will help to uh, stimulate the secretion of pituitary hormones and inhibitory hormones. So some of them are uh, releasing hormones that stimulate the anterior pituitary hormones, and some of them inhibit the secretion of the anterior pituitary hormones. It's kind of like an on-off switch for it. So where is the hypothalamus? Remember that it's in the brain. Uh, so here, this oval shape up here is the thalamus. Here is the hypothalamus, this kind of turquoise area. Down here, these two uh, bean-like structures, globular structures, are the pituitary glands. You have an anterior pituitary and a posterior because there's two lobes to it. And it's connected to the hypothalamus by that infrabedulum. So as I just said, the pituitary gland does have two lobes. The posterior is comprised of neural tissue. It does store and then secrete those hormones, two of them, um, the oxytocin and the ADH. But remember, it doesn't produce them. They're produced in the hypothalamus. They're sent and stored in the posterior pituitary. It's simply a storage facility, if you want to think of it that way. And then they'll be secreted from there. Now, the anterior pituitary is glandular tissue, and it does secrete several different hormones, specifically seven. Uh, some of the hormones are tropic hormones. A tropic hormone just means that its purpose is to turn on or off other endocrine glands. You'll notice oftentimes with the endocrine system that it's kind of a cascade effect, that uh, hormone A turns on hormone B, and then you get a response. So it's kind of a stepwise process. So with, once again, the hypothalamus making these hormones, but the posterior pituitary storing and secreting them, oxytocin. And as we start on the looking through this, a good study habit uh, that I often suggest is to take a sheet of paper and make a table. And so in one column, list the gland, list like the hypothalamus, and then in the next column, list the hormone that it produces. And then in the next column, state what the function of that hormone, what does it do? And then possibly what its target cell is. And if you put it in a table, it'll make a very good uh, study guide for you, study resource. And I think it kind of helps to put everything together. So oxytocin, uh, what is its function? It helps to stimulate the contractions of the uterus during childbirth. It will also help with uh, the reflex of the milk ejection once the newborn starts to nurse. The antidiuretic hormone, what this does is it stimulates uh, in the kidney for you to reabsorb water. I know we haven't studied uh, kidneys and the urinary system at this point in time yet, but just very briefly, the blood that flows into the kidneys, it's filtered. That's the job of the kidneys is to filter the blood. Most of uh, the substances in the blood actually are 
were removed. They filter out, and then it's the kidney's job to basically to kind of decide what and how much do you put back into the blood. You want to maintain the volume of the blood, but you want to filter out toxins. But one of the other things that it's going to do is filter out uh, things like sodium and potassium. How much of that do you put back into the blood before it leaves the kidneys? Well, it depends on what is going on right now. So if there is a stimulus that you're getting dehydrated, you don't want to get dehydrated. The antidiuretic hormone is going to be stimulated to reabsorb more of the water and put it back into the blood to prevent you from getting dehydrated. Now there are certain diseases and disorders and conditions that can interfere with the antidiuretic hormone. Um, some blood pressure medications, people talk about them being water pills. What does it do? That inhibits the ADH. Alcohol inhibits ADH. So if you inhibit ADH, what's going to happen? Well, the kidneys are not going to reabsorb as much water. In other words, more of the water will leave your body in the urine. Your urine becomes very dilute. Basically, you're going to pee a lot. Um, there is a disease, diabetes insipidus. And the cause of this disease is that you are not producing enough ADH. So you are not reabsorbing enough water and there's a danger of always being dehydrated, regardless of how much water you drink. Um, I actually have a sister who has this and she always has a water bottle in her hand. She's constantly drinking water because she knows if she doesn't, and even with drinking water, she has to be very careful that she does not um, become dehydrated. Why is it? Because well, she suffers from kidney disease and uh, she does not also produce enough of the ADH to reabsorb that water. This is just showing that uh, up here in this area where you have your hypothalamus, here is the stalk or the infidulum where you have produced the oxytocin and the ADH and it's going to move down here and be stored in the posterior pituitary which then is going to release it. Now the anterior pituitary gland does produce several hormones, seven of them as I mentioned earlier. It produces the growth hormone, which helps to promote growth of all the body tissues. It produces a thyroid stimulating hormone. As the name implies, this will stimulate the thyroid hormone release from the thyroid gland. So this is an example of a tropic hormone where one hormone is stimulating the release of another. The ACTH, the adrenal cortotropic hormone, stimulates hormone release by the adrenal cortex. The follicle stimulating hormone stimulates gamete production in the gonads, so it's going to stimulate the egg production or the ova production in the ovaries, and it will stimulate sperm production in the uh, testes. Luteinizing hormone is going to stimulate androgen production by the, both the ovaries and the testes. It also is going to be involved with triggering ovulation, and obviously in females. Beta endorphin is another hormone. This is a very powerful pain suppressor. And then prolactin is the last one that uh, is going to help promote the milk production from the mammary glands. And this is showing once again, you've got your hypothalamus, and here's the anterior pituitary. The intermediate pituitary, it's just that area between the pituitary lobes. It does uh, produce the melanocyte stimulating hormone. It stimulates melanin production in your melanocytes, which helps to provide uh, skin color. It plays a role with that. Your thyroid gland uh, is actually, if you look at it, has two lobes. Some people describe it kind of looking like a butterfly in a way, but it has two lobes. The lobes are connected by what's known as the isthmus. The 
production of the thyroid hormone is dependent on iodine. If you are deficient in iodine, it is going to have an effect on the thyroid hormones. For that reason, most of your developing countries, what they do to make sure everyone gets enough iodine, they do include iodine in certain foods, such as salt. Have you ever noticed when you buy salt, it says salt with iodine? Ever wondered why there's iodine in there? Because the thyroid hormone is dependent on it, it has to bind to the iodine. Your thyroxine, which is also known as T4, because it'll bind to four iodine molecules, and triodine threonine or T3, those both help to stimulate basically uh, your base metabolic rates. Calcitonin is another one of the hormones produced by the thyroid gland. Calcitonin is going to be um, involved in reducing blood calcium levels. So when calcium levels get too high in the blood, it will trigger the release of calcitonin, which is going to help bring it down. So in this picture, you can see here from the anterior view, here's your trachea, which connects uh, the pharynx down to your lungs. So you can see right here is the thyroid. And the little connection point right there, that's the isthmus that I was talking about. From a posterior view, you can see it kind of wraps around, so you see the edges of it coming around the sides. There are a couple of disorders associated with the thyroid gland that I just want to briefly mention. Hypothyroidism, hypo means less. So that the symptoms that you usually see are uh, a low metabolic rate, oftentimes weight gain, oftentimes the person's extremities. So fingers or toes are going to be cold. Sometimes they suffer from constipation, menstrual irregularities, etc. <coughs> All of this is due to the fact that they are not producing enough of the thyroid hormones. Hyperthyroidism, you have too much. So increased metabolic rate, excessive body heat, sweating, diarrhea, weight loss, tremors, increased heart rate. Um, how do you treat these? Well, if you have hypothyroidism, we do have synthetic thyroid that you can take. Take a pill. That will help. Now you have to monitor it and adjust so you're getting the right level so that you don't end up with hyperthyroidism. So you have to keep a balance. If somebody is overproducing the thyroid um, hormone, if it gets too high, one way that they can treat that is by removing the thyroid gland. If they do this, and it, they've done it, a lot of people have had this done. If they do that, obviously now you're no longer producing any thyroid hormone because you don't have a thyroid gland. So you go from hyper to hypo. So if they remove the thyroid gland, then you're going to have to take medication to get the appropriate concentration of those thyroid hormones. Calcitonin, as I said, that's uh, released, produced by the thyroid gland and released. As I said a bit ago, it's released in response to when blood calcium levels are high. It is released. The purpose is to reduce, bring that calcium level back down to normal range. How does it do this? It is going to inhibit the osteoclasts. Remember, those are the cells in the bone that are breaking down the matrix, the bone matrix, which has calcium in it. So you want to, hey, guys, stop releasing that. It's going to stimulate the osteoblast. Osteoblasts are the ones who are forming the bone matrix. So it's kind of like, okay, osteoblasts, we need you to start making more bone. It will increase the amount of calcium that is going to be released in your urine. So it has effect not only on the bones, but on the kidneys. And then it's also going to have an effect on the intestines. How? Because it's going to decrease the amount of calcium that gets absorbed in the intestines. You don't need to absorb anymore. We got too much. The parathyroid glands, there's four small glands. They're embedded on the posterior side of the thyroid gland. You have two of them in each of those lobes of the thyroid gland. Parathyroid hormone. 
Some of these are going to be easy remembering which hormone is made by which gland. So the parathyroid hormone, or PTH, is produced by the parathyroid gland. It's secreted in response to low blood calcium levels. So it's going to be the opposite of calcitonin. It's going to stimulate those osteoclasts to start breaking down the bone matrix and releasing that calcium. It inhibits osteoblasts. Don't make more bone. Don't put more calcium in that bone matrix. We need all the calcium in the blood. It's going to increase the reabsorption of calcium in the kidneys. Don't let it go in the urine. We need it. And it's going to stimulate the production of what's known as calcitriol, which is in the intestines. It's going to increase the absorption of calcium. One thing I do want to say about calcitriol, this is basically a form of vitamin D. This is why you need vitamin D in order to absorb calcium. You need that calcitriol. Without it, you cannot absorb calcium. You can have all the calcium in your diet, but you can't absorb it. So once again, if you look at different things like dairy products, which tend to be very high in calcium, notice how it always says fortified with vitamin D. Ever wonder why? There's no sense drinking all that milk if you can't absorb the calcium in it. So they put the vitamin D, which is basic calcitriol, to help you uh, absorb that. The end result is that it will increase the calcium levels, bring it back up to the normal range. This, um, I thought this was kind of a cool picture uh, showing of you've got your thyroid gland, and here you can see your four parathyroid glands embedded in there. The adrenal glands, <coughs> excuse me, they are located on top of the kidneys. As we often see, we can divide things into multiple layers. Cortex, whenever you see that, that's always on the outer layer. You will see this again like with the kidney. You've seen this with hair shot. The medulla is going to be the inner layer. With the adrenal glands, the adrenal cortex is the outer tissue uh, layer. It's composed of glandular tissue. It tends to respond to long-term stress. It's composed of three different layers the zona uh, glomulosa, zona vesticulate, and zona reticularis. And then the innermost layer is the medulla, and that is actually comprised of nervous tissue, and it's going to respond to short-term stress. So this is showing the kidneys, and on top of it is where the adrenal glands sit. If we look at the adrenal cortex, at the different layers, uh, the outermost layer of the zona glomerulosa produces your mineral corticoids, such as aldosterone. This is going to regulate sodium and potassium. And how is it regulated? It's going to regulate it in your urine. How much is released in the urine? How much is released also in your sweat and your saliva? So it tends to respond to very low blood volume and low blood pressure. This is zona vesticulata produces your glucocorticoids. These cortisol and those related cortisol compounds tend to inhibit <coughs> excuse me, tissue building. It stimulates the breakdown of stored nutrients, including breaking glycogen down to glucose. It inhibits the inflammatory uh, response. Because it inhibits the inflammatory response, that's why sometimes um, with certain situations, you might hear like cortisol uh, shots or cortisone uh, creams, etc. It's helping to, to inhibit that inflammatory response. And then the zona reticularis produces some of your androgens. This combination table and picture is showing a cross section of the adrenal gland. So once again, the medulla is the most interior portion. The cortex is the outermost portion of it. We have a layer of fat around it. So you can see the three different layers here of the adrenal cortex, those three different zones. You can see the hormones that are released, whether it's regulating the mineral balance, such as aldosterone, regulating glucose, such as your cortisols, um, and the androgens. And then the 
is showing down here the adrenal medulla, the innermost one. Remember, this is nervous tissue. Um, that's going to be dealing with uh, short-term stress. The adrenal medulla involves your sympathetic nervous division. That sympathetic nervous division, uh, remember, is your fight or flight. It is triggered under crisis type situations, which would obviously be an acute short term stress situation. What hormones <coughs> excuse me, are made in the adrenal medulla? It's your epinephrine and norepinephrine. Now, the older names of these are adrenaline and noradrenaline. So they've changed the names. Them. Uh, both of these, the epinephrine is made in much higher uh, concentration than the norepinephrine. Both of them have similar effects that they will stimulate both the liver and the skeletal muscles to convert your glucagon, which is a storage form of glucose, to glucose. So when you have excess glucose, it's converted to glucagon. Well, it's going to break it back, convert it back to glucose. Why? Because it wants to increase your blood glucose levels. Why? Because in a stressful situation, in a crisis situation where the sympathetic nervous division has been activated, that fight or flight, um, you may need to be running or you may need to be fighting. Both of those involve muscle contraction. And what does muscle contraction require? ATP. Where do you get ATP from? Breaking down glucose. So if you're going to have to be running for a while or you're going to have to be fighting to save your life, um, you're going to have a lot of muscle contraction, which bottom line is you need a lot of glucose. So take all that storage form of it, of the glucagon, and convert it to glucose. Where is that often stored? In the liver and the skeletal muscles. So start converting it to glucose so you can increase the level of glucose in the blood. You're going to increase the heart rate, pulse, and blood pressure. You're going to dilate the airways. Why? Because you need more oxygen because oxygen is required for muscle contraction. Why? Because you need ATP. And to convert that glucose, break it down to get ATP for energy, that requires oxygen. So you're going to dilate the airways. Why? So you can get more air in, more oxygen in, increase the heart rate, pulse, and blood pressure to get that blood flowing faster so you can get the oxygen from the lungs to the muscles where you're going to need it. Vasodilation, that means increasing the diameter of the blood vessels in the lungs to get more oxygen in, in the heart, in the skeletal muscles, and in the brain. It causes vasoconstriction, which is a decrease in the diameter along the, of the blood vessels in the gastrointestinal tract, in the kidneys, in the skin, and part of the immune system. Why? Well, you can't cut off the blood so supply completely because then you start to have tissue death occurring. You don't want that. But you can decrease the amount of blood. Like I say, don't shut it off completely. But if you are in a life or death situation, um, you don't have to worry about filtering that, that blood and producing urine. You don't have to worry about breaking down the hamburger you just ate. It won't matter. You need to have the blood flow. You try to keep the overall blood volume the same, but you can redistribute the where it's going in terms of decrease the amount where you don't need it, but increase it where you do need it. Where do you need it? The lungs, the heart, the skeletal muscles, and the brain. But decrease it to the kidneys. Decrease it to the digestive organs. Decrease it to the reproductive organs. You don't. If you're not alive in 10 minutes, it's not going to matter for that. You tend to also get a dry mouth, loss of appetite, and pupil dilation. Pupil dilation occurs so that you get more light coming in, and it helps to increase your vision. If you're in a crisis situation, you need to be very much aware of everything around you. You'll notice that your senses become very, very uh, acute and pronounced. You're very much aware of everything around you. 
that's the response of the sympathetic nervous division. Why? These are all effects of the epinephrine and norepinephrine that are being released in this situation. Where do they come from? The adrenal medulla. The pineal gland is a small gland in the brain. We'll have a picture of it in just a second. It does produce um, melatonin. Melatonin is derived from serotonin. So what does melatonin do? Well, it responds to light. Light tends to inhibit the melatonin production. And when it inhibits melatonin production, that's what makes you awake, essentially. Dark tends to stimulate melatonin production, causing drowsiness and sleepiness. So melatonin is involved with your sleep-wake cycle, that circadian cycle. And how is, so mel, let me put it this way. Melatonin is involved with the sleep-wake cycle. So if you have a lot of melatonin being uh, secreted, that's going to make you sleepy. If there's very little, it's going to make you wake. How is melatonin production um, regulated? The light. It is actually light that regulates it. So what happens, <coughs> excuse me, the light, this structure right here is stimulated by light waves. For reference point, here's your pituitary gland that we've already talked about. Here's the hypothalamus. Here's the thalamus. There's the pons and the medulla and oblongata and then your, your uh, spinal cord. So your eyes are going to be up here. Light waves are going to come in. And this is the uh, structure that will be stimulated by the light waves. And in turn, that stimulates right here is the pineal gland. It's this little tiny structure on the back side, right behind the thalamus. And that's what's going to be secreting the, the um, melatonin. The testes produce testosterone and inhibin. Testosterone is uh, responsible for the development of the male reproductive system. It's also responsible for the maturation of the sperm cells and also development of those male secondary sex characteristics that you see develop during uh, puberty, deepening of the voice, et cetera, things like that. Inhibin is a hormone that is also secreted by the testes. It will inhibit the secretion of the follicle stimulating hormone, which stimulates spermatogenesis or the production of sperm. In the ovaries, you see uh, production of estrogens. That's going to be responsible for development of the female reproductive system. It's involved with helping to regulate the menstrual cycle. It is also responsible for development now of the female secondary sex characteristics that, once again, we see develop at puberty. Estrogens are important in helping in maintenance of pregnancy. Another hormone that is produced by the ovaries is progesterone, which is involved with the regulation of the menstrual cycle. It is also involved with helping to prepare the uterus for pregnancy and maintaining that pregnancy as well. So those estrogen and progesterone work together on that aspect. Inhibin is also uh, produced by the ovaries, and that inhibits, once again, as you saw in the males, the secretion of the follicle-stimulating hormone. <coughs> Excuse me. The placenta, when a woman is pregnant, uh, the placenta helps to provide nourishment for the developing uh, fetus, gets rid of the waste products, etc. Well, it also produces some hormones. It will produce the human coronic gonadotropin, or HCG. This helps to promote progesterone synthesis during the pregnancy, to help, which in turn helps to maintain the pregnancy. It also plays a role in helping to kind of inhibit the immune response against the fetus. You don't want um, the mother's immune system to respond to the fetus as a foreign entity and attack and destroy it. Uh, just so you know, the HCG, that is sometimes referred to as the pregnancy hormone in terms of like pregnancy tests. That's what they are looking for. Um, 
the human placental lactogen helps to prepare the breast for lactation and then relaxin is another hormone produced by the placenta uh, this is going to help soften and widen the pubic symphysis to help pre uh, prepare for childbirth makes it a little bit easier for the fetus to pass through the um, the birth canal The pancreas, now this is an organ that is definitely part of the endocrine system as well as the digestive system. So once again, just like the hypothalamus, you see where some of these glands um, and structures, they have multiple roles. With the pancreas, you have an area that's known as the pancreatic islets, also formerly known as the islets of Langerhorn. So depending on what book you pick up, or whom you talk to, depending on when they went to school, you may hear one or the other of these terms. But these areas do secrete several hormones. There are different types of cells within the pancreas. And so within the islets of Langerhans, you have what are known as alpha cells. It is the alpha cells that produce glucagon, which is going to help increase blood glucose levels. It's going to break uh, glycogon down to glucose, so it's going to increase the glucose levels. The beta cells in these islets are going to produce the insulin. Insulin is going to help decrease the blood glucose levels. So these two are antagonistic towards each other. They have opposing effects. Somatostatin is produced by the delta cells. This is going to inhibit both insulin and glucagon release. So if glucose levels are normal, somatostatin is going to want to inhibit both the insulin and the glucagon. And then the pancreatic polypeptide is produced by the PP cells. They seem to play a role in appetite. They used to always think that it played a role in, like as you ate, um, kind of helping with that feeling of fullness so you don't overeat but they've also found that they're very active in people who are fasting so they know it plays a role in appetite but we don't there's a lot of things we don't know and we still don't know for sure how it plays that role so in this picture here this is the pancreas right here now it is located right below and kind of behind the stomach. So your stomach obviously is not shown, but it would be right here. This is your spleen over here on the side. And this is uh, your small intestines right here. So right this yellow area, this whole yellow area is the pancreas. If you were to look at some of these areas, these little group of dots, that is showing the uh, pancreatic islets or islets of Langerhans. Now there are some other structures. We'll study these when we study the digestive system because like I said, it works in both systems. So if we look at one of these pancreatic islets here, you can see that you have some alpha cells and then you have the white beta cells that are present in here. So ex excess glucose is stored as glycogen, and as we mentioned earlier, that's often stored in the liver. When you convert that glycogen to glucose, when you break it down, that is known as glycogen lysis. You're breaking it down. Gluconeogenesis is a conversion of various compounds into glucose, so you're making glucose. You might be taking amino acids, combining them with some lipids, and you get all the carbons and hydrogen and oxygens all in the right proportion to make the glucose. So neogenesis is making or forming something new. What are you forming? Glucose. So gluconeogenesis basically is the formation of glucose. How can you do that? Glycogenolysis is like a subtype of gluconeogenesis. Two disorders that I want to mention um, associate with the pancreas. Hyperglycemia is elevated blood glucose. So your, your blood glucose levels are too high. The way you need to respond to this is release insulin. Hypoglycemia is low blood glucose, so you need to release the glucagon. 
So glucagon is the hormone that's going to do this. It will break glycogen down to glucose. That's the way it's able to increase the glucose levels in the blood. So this uh, table is in your book. It might be a little bit hard to read. I tried to enlarge it as much as I could. So if you measure your blood glucose levels, um, general recommendation, they used, to, they used to say between 80 and 120. They really like to get it below 100. Um, so in this case, it's showing 90 milligrams per deciliter. It's just the measurement that they used. So if the level of glucose in your blood, and that's what a uh, glucose meter is measuring, if you are hyperglycemic, you have a high level of glucose. It's higher than normal. So what is the body going to do to bring it back down to normal? Is that it is going to release insulin because insulin is going to trigger the body to uh, take the cells to be able to take up more glucose, get it out of the blood that way. It's going to inhibit glycogenolysis. Don't break any more of the glycogen down. Store it in the liver. We don't, we don't need it. Don't make any new. Don't have any gluconeogenesis going on. We don't need any more glucose. We're too high as it is. If you inhibit these processes of making more glucose and you store glucose in the liver and you allow cells to take up glucose more easily, you're going to decrease the level of glucose in the blood. Get it back down to normal. If you're hypoglycemic, you have low uh, levels of glucose in the blood. That is going to trigger the release of the glucagon, which now you need more glucose in the blood. So what is it going to do? Basically the opposite here. It's going to inhibit cells from taking up glucose. We need the glucose in the blood. Where you have that glucagon stored in, the glycogen stored in the liver, break it down to glucose, releasing that glucose in the blood. Stimulate gluconeogenesis, let amino acids and lipids, etc., those building blocks form glucose and get that glucose once again in the blood so the blood glucose level rises and you're back to normal. There are several organs that do uh, produce other hormones that help with the regulation, we tend to look at them more as we study that particular organ. So we refer to these as um, organs with secondary endocrine functions, just so that you are aware. Once again, this whole idea that, that some organs have multiple functions. You can't place them necessarily just in a little uh, nice cubby hole of they only function in this one system. They have multiple functions. And these organs include the heart. There are certain hormones that are going to be released there that will involve or play a role with things such as a heart rate, blood pressure, the gastrointestinal tract to assist with the breakdown and absorption of the nutrients that you just took in. The kidneys. Kidneys play a huge role uh, with helping to maintain things such as blood volume, blood pressure and things such as sodium, potassium, and calcium, how much of this remains in the blood? Do you have too much? Do you have too little? The skeleton, once again, playing roles with like calcium, adipose tissue, the skin, the thymus, as I said earlier, which is an endocrine gland. We tend to focus on it more with the immune system, and then the liver as well. So just be aware of those.